Hello again, this is History 322, and it's week nine. Week nine and audio one. This week we're going to talk about the so-called tigers or little dragons. That is the economies of, um, of the periphery of China that arose in the 1960s to double-digit growth and prosperity for their populations. And then we will talk about Australia's uh, escalating and modern role in Asia. So let's skip over slide two. Here we are, part one. The tigers or dragons uh, go on to slide three. So on this map, which became popular as a depiction in the 1970s showing people in the West uh, and elsewhere what was going on in Asia, um, this map shows these four countries that were nicknamed the Little Dragons or the Tigers, the economic tigers of Asia, because of their quick growth and industrialization and because of the growing wealth of their populations and their expanding middle classes. That is uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Their economies uh, took off in the 1960s, especially uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, which was no accident because the United States, uh, in part because the United States wished to uh, use them to contain China uh, socially and economically, um, uh, if not uh, politically. And they served as a economic bulwark against the expansion of communism uh, and also as a, an example of what free market economics could do for a population. Um, they served, in other words, as a, an example of um, why it was a good thing to avoid a socialist economy um, and therefore what happened served as a sort of a Marshall Plan, uh, an informal sort of Marshall Plan in Asia. Uh, you can see of course that these four places are on China's periphery um, and of course made some Chinese policymakers, probably all, feel as though the United States was uh, trying to um, to contain their influence, not only politically and militarily, but also economically. So Japan became involved in this rapid growth in the region, and these economies um, in general followed the example of Japan, as we'll see as we, uh, as we go on. Uh, let's uh, go now to slide four and talk about something. This, this may make your eyes glaze over, but I promise to make it interesting. So <laughs> import substitution versus export-oriented industrialization. Um, this slide um, carries a summary of these two kinds of growth. Now, you might want to uh, stop the recording anytime during the next uh, minute or two to look at each of these points. I don't want to talk to them in great detail. I just want to try to give you an overview to understand what we're talking about. So before the mid-1960s, um, ISI, Import Substitution Industrialization, was considered a good way to move former colonial economies into greater independence in world markets. Now, we learned a few weeks ago that the former colonial economies, Malaya, um, Vietnam, and, uh, and the rest of Indochina, Indonesia, were tied to their mother countries in Europe economically and politically. In Malaya, uh, the rubber and tin that was produced there went to markets in the UK, in Britain, which then 
made manufactured goods that were turned around and shipped back to the colonies, uh, which were captive markets, of course. Um, and this um, exchange of money, exchange of uh, capital inflow and outflow between colony and mother country, um, in essence, uh, uh, it, it was not only a nasty, bad imperialist thing, it was also uh, a phenomenon that uh, prevented economic dislocation for both sets of parties, both colonized and colonizer. So in a sense, it, it uh, served some positive purpose. Uh, but in the post-colonial era, there were no more apron strings to be tied to, to uh, to try to uh, prevent economic dislocations, to, um, to, stop, to stop problems from happening when there were the inevitable economic downturns. And so policymakers decided to follow this model uh, of the import substitution industrialization. They decided to um, um, begin protecting their own industries with high tariffs. By doing this, they were able to produce their own light consumer goods like bicycles, flashlights, soap, uh, cutlery, uh, and so on. And, and they also began to do uh, some export businesses in order to generate foreign currency. So by making all these things at home that used to come from the colonies, they were substituting those imports from the uh, from the colonial power, sorry, they were substituting these imports they used to get from the colonial power and making these things themselves and then putting high taxes on similar imports. So that meant that they were protecting their own industries. Um, and, and, uh, and this was a very different sort of, of um, strategy than the export-oriented industrialization. Now, that came <clears throat> in these uh, ow, in these tiger in these uh, tiger uh, economies, um, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Singapore, um, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, <laughs> and Taiwan. By um, by changing the nature of the economy, so that on the as you see on the right hand side of the slide so that it was um, um, oriented toward, toward um, exporting to other countries with government support. Um, and I'm not going to go through all these points. You could stop the, the audio here and read through them, but I, I think they're self-explanatory. But the main point is that these four Asian tigers were the first to make this transition in the 1960s, and they began to reap very visible social and economic benefits. Uh, a middle class began to form in each country, an elite, um, and the people who worked for the elite uh, began to form in each country. Um, another main point is that multinational corporations and these local elites um, really fell in love with, with export-oriented uh, um, industrialization because it was far more profitable and the results uh, were to create an industry connected elite, uh, the managers who ran the plants, the, the, um, the people who were involved in the marketing and the distribution of the goods, um, and these people uh, became a new elite that was tied to um, modern economic activity, and they were to lead their societies toward greater integration with the world economy, and uh, of course this meant that they were not interested in socialism. Um, and this, of course, helped to meet the goals, the foreign policy goals of the United States, um, and the developing foreign policy goals of Japan, and so this was a good thing in the eyes of those decision makers. Let's go on now to slide five um, and dig a little bit deeper into what happened when the four tigers adopted export-oriented industrialization. <clears throat> 
Um, so the advantages, uh, I think, to large businesses uh, we've made obvious. There were, of course, objections to this model, um, mostly focused on how they benefited the elites instead of ordinary people. Um, the counter-argument tended to note that increased taxes allowed for establishment of public universities to train um, um, people who were not from the elite to raise themselves up in society, and the increased number of people with higher incomes led to uh, better and longer lives for all, um, as long as there was competent regulation. And that became the complicated problem um, of, uh, of, um, of uneven growth with dissatisfied non-elites. Uh, when when um, regulation was not done properly, then the problem became that uh, corruption developed. And indeed, uh, this is a problem in uh, in I would say, except for Hong Kong, Hong Kong is less of a has less of a corruption problem, but uh, Taiwan certainly has uh, has one to a to a degree, and used to have a, a fairly substantial corruption problem. Uh, Malaysia, Malaya, and Singapore, uh, Indonesia. Uh, of course, I'm getting outside the list of tigers now, um, and even South Korea uh, also developed um, problems with uh, corruption that that uh, were in excess of what was found at those levels um, in European countries. We'll stop here and go on to slide six.